and welcome to the fifth session in our Green Entrepreneurship Online Workshop Series. Today's topic will be impact investing and fundraising for green startups. And we've got a great panel of experts from all across North America lined up today to explore this, uh, this topic and these ideas with us. Um, I do want to suggest that uh, if, if you're joining us for the first time, you may want to select the, the language uh, you would prefer to hear the presentations in by going to the bottom of your screen and clicking the interpretation icon. Uh, you can click that icon and select your preferred language from amongst English, French, or Spanish, and then click it again and mute the original audio channel. And that will ensure that you hear all of the content uh, in the language of your preference. Um, later on, we'll, we'll give some instructions on how to sort of ask questions and take part in the Q&A sessions. But the first step for getting the content in your preferred language is to follow those directions around the interpretation icon. My name is Brock Dickinson. I am the entrepreneur in residence with the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and it's my privilege to introduce uh, today's session. Uh, I want to begin, as is our custom in Canada, with a land acknowledgement. And in this instance, we want to acknowledge that the University of Waterloo is situated on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, in, in addition, the University of Waterloo is actually situated on the Haldeman Tract, which is a, a, an area of land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. We also want to acknowledge some of the partners that have helped to make today's session a reality. Uh, as those of you who have been participating throughout the series know, uh, this particular series is sponsored by the University of Waterloo, but in direct partnership with the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And we're very grateful to the Commission for its continued support uh, through this process. We also want to acknowledge our partners in the Eco Innovation Network, another sponsor of this particular series. This is a collection of eight uh, universities across North America with an interest in green innovation uh, and we have all been working together behind the scenes to help promote and develop this series of events uh, and maybe I'll, I'll take a moment this week to just acknowledge a few of those partners. Uh, Tom Wavering at the University of Oklahoma has done a great job of helping us spread the word uh, in the United States. Uh, Omar Chavez Alegria, Dr. Dr. Omar Chavez at um, Queretaro University in Mexico has been attending every session and has been helping us get the word out. There is a very dynamic group of students from uh, Sagrado Corazon in, Cor in, in Puerto Rico that has been helping to promote this event. Uh, and some great students from Caratero who've been uh, very involved in, in, in promoting this too. So I, I just wanna say thank you to everybody who's helped to, to make this network uh, series a, a reality. We're very appreciative of, of the work that you have done. Uh, I've mentioned the translation function. So please, if you can click the interpretation button and select your preferred language. Later in the session, we'll move into a Q&A session as well. So the chat function is open and you can talk with other participants through the chat function, but we're not actively monitoring the chat. If you have a question that you would like to pose to one of the presenters or one of the panelists, use the Q&A function to do that. We are monitoring that function. We can uh, provide translation of questions from any of our three languages, uh, and we'll make sure that some of those questions at the appropriate time get brought forward to our panelists and presenters so that they can respond to the, the questions and, and the ideas that, that you want to share at the appropriate time. So, so please use the Q&A function uh, for, for that particular activity. And with that, I'd now like to turn things over to our MC for today. Uh, Majid Mirza will be the master of ceremonies for today's event. And I just wanted to take a, a quick moment to, to introduce him. He is a green entrepreneur. Uh, in April of this year, he founded a company called ESG Tree which is involved in the use of data to support environmental, social, and governance metrics with an eye particularly to understanding the needs of investors. He has previously worked uh, for the, the Mennonite Economic Development Associates. He's worked for the Amman Foundation and the Engro Foundation in Pakistan. Uh, and he is actually, while in the midst of all this, he's, he's also a student at the University of Waterloo where he's currently completing his PhD in sustainability management. Uh, as a student, he's been my TA in the entrepreneurship and environment program, and he's been absolutely instrumental in making this series a success. So it's a real pleasure to have him front and center so you all get to meet him today. And with that, Majid, I'll, I'll turn things over to you. 
Brock, thank you so much for the great introduction. I think today is a particularly exciting day because uh, we have such a diverse panel. We're actually being represented by academia, private sector, uh, nonprofit sector, and the startup world. So it's <laughs> the, all the major uh, stakeholders are here. Let me just give a quick um, introduction about how the panel will unfold before we go to uh, some slides. And the way that we've structured the panel is that um, I'll kick off the session with a few interesting facts about impact investing and the impact investing spectrum, uh, as they call it. Um, then I'm going to invite each of our uh, expert panelists to talk for about 10 minutes on the topic of impact investing and fundraising for green startups. Uh, I'll make sure to introduce each, spe uh, each speaker before they speak. And uh, while our panelists are speaking, uh, please think about questions you may have for them once they're done. And you can type those to the Q&A function on, on Zoom. And we'll also have an open Q&A at the end of the session where you can use the QA function again in Zoom to post questions directly to the panelists. Uh, we'll do our best to select a few representative questions uh, from, uh, we usually get quite a few questions and we'll try to make sure we group some questions together and we'll try to conclude in about 90 minutes time. So with that, let me start sharing a couple of slides, literally a few minutes to set the stage um, about uh, this session, um, after which I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Olaf Weber. So impact investing. Let me just get the full screen up, display settings, great. So the impact investing sector has doubled in size over the last two years, according to the Global Impact Investing Network's 2019 report on sizing the impact investing market. And according to the same report, impact investors say their impact investing allocations will continue to grow. So just to set the stage before I invite Olaf on, let's look at a few interesting facts. Over the next 40 years, baby boomers will transfer $41 trillion in assets to millennials. Um, this is known as the uh, world's largest transfer of wealth in human history. But alongside that, 67% of millennials uh, believe their investment decisions are a way to express their social, political, or environmental values. So it's a very interesting dynamic. $41 trillion of wealth being transferred to a segment which strongly aligns investment with social, political, environmental values. I'd also uh, recall another uh, statistic by Deloitte that 63% uh, of millennials believe that uh, improving society is a more important objective of business than to make profits. So these are very large trends taking place really to be taken seriously. And $1 trillion is estimated by the end of the year in 2020 to be committed in impact investing with um, over $660 billion estimated in profits to be made uh, within this sector. Um, so taking some of that data into account, I just wanted to present um, what's well known as the impact investing spectrum uh, when thinking about what really is impact investing. So on the left, you have a fully oriented um, approach to positive impact, which exists in the form of philanthropy. And there's very, very little talk about returns um, on that side. But as you go towards the right to the spectrum, you get into thematic investing, which many times is very aligned with the sustainable development goals, and then into ESG or environmental social governance screening and then to um, socially responsible investing or SRI, which is taking out um, bad apples. So businesses that are not in um, industries that would be conducive, like say tobacco, gambling, alcohol, etc. And then you get to mainstream investing, which doesn't consider impact at all. So I always find this a very useful way to understand impact investing is that there's fully um, impact driven investing, 
but then we slowly go along the spectrum and there's various firms and organizations for profit and nonprofit acting along this spectrum. So with that um, introduction, um, I'd like to go into introducing um, Dr. Olaf Weber and I would request him to um, start sharing his slides while I do that. Um, Dr. Olaf Weber is a professor of the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development or SEED. In addition, he holds the position as the University of Waterloo's Research Chair in Sustainable Finance and is Senior Fellow of um, CG. His research and teaching interests address the connection between the financial sector players such as banks and sustainable development and the link between sustainability and financial performance of enterprises. His research focus is on the impacts of the financial industry on sustainable development, the role of voluntary and regulatory mechanisms for the financial sector to become more sustainable, social banking and impact investing, as well as the materiality of sustainability risks and opportunities for investors and artificial intelligence as a tool to analyze environmental, social and governance performance. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Olaf. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Ajit and uh, Mr. Weber, can you please slow down a bit when uh, presenting? Thank you so much. Thank you. I will try to. Thanks a lot, Majid, and thanks a lot, Brock. Um, uh, I really miss you meeting you in person. You know, Brock is usually giving a, a presentation in my class that uh, students like. So, but this is a great way uh, to connect. And I think. Uh, yeah, my role is to give you some kind of background in the topic of social banking and impact investing as usually academics do. And so, um, yeah, I, I wanna give you some numbers, some uh, theoretical background, some definitions and some applications of social banking and impact investing. So um, I want to start with two, two stories, um, maybe just uh, to, to um, keep it not too, uh, theoretical. So um, first, uh, an, uh, a story of social banking. And so this is a story of Van City. This is the, uh, the biggest credit union in Canada, um, you know, not taking into account the, the Caisse, uh, Caisse de Pau Quebec, that is a kind of a, of a network. So they are based in Vancouver and then, and they are a social bank that has, that has the, the goal uh, to have a full impact portfolio, so all clients uh, should have a positive impact on uh, on the environment, so society, or sustainable development. And this is an example. So this is a flexible, environmentally conscious daycare. And you can see if you have a look on this description. So it's 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 run. Uh, there is this Aboriginal Capital Corporation uh, is involved. It is more flexible. It has an ethical approach. It also has an as an environmental approach. And this is a kind of a typical project uh, uh, where that, uh, uh, that a social bank is, is lending to. Um, you find similar projects in the field of the environment, uh, for instance, uh, organic farming, um, uh, but um, so social and environmental um, impacts are, are one of the, the main purposes these types of banks have. And um, another example is uh, is just uh, um, uh, is just regional. So this is uh, Serona. So this is an asset manager based in in Kitchener, uh, Ontario, and uh, they are mainly investing in emerging and developing countries and um, to address development issues. And there you see already in their report that's not the usual asset management report that you see. But they report about how many jobs have been created through their investments, um, how they empower women through their investment, how they improve job quality and governance, and how they reduce environmental footprints, and how do they how they contribute to sustainable communities. So they have certain due diligence processes in place that address these issues and therefore um, have a have a positive uh, impact on sustainable development, the environment. And, and the society. So these are two, two, two examples that you have an idea what uh, social banking and impact um, investing is about. And so I want to go a bit more into detail uh, and describing uh, what this is. So um, what is the goal of social banking and impact investing? So it is 
to create a positive impact on society, the environment and sustainable development by means of banking and finance. So these might be savings accounts so that you have a savings account and the savings are exclusively used for, uh, for financing um, impact investments. And this might be loans to, to certain uh, borrowers that uh, address environmental and societal issues, investments, bonds, and other uh, banking products and services, mutual funds, for instance. So social finance uh, is an approach uh, to manage money that delivers uh, social and or environmental benefits, and in most cases, a financial return. So again, you see financial returns are not the first criterion for social finance, but they are a part of it. So it's not like making grants that financial returns don't play a role at all, but um, um, in uh, uh, different to, for example, social responsible investing or responsible investing. So the, the social aspect uh, comes first and then the financial return aspect. So social finance uh, encourages positive social or environmental solutions at a scale that neither are purely philanthropic uh, nor typically traditional uh, 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 investment. Um, so one subgroup of social finance is social banking. And uh, very similar, social banking aims to have a positive impact on people, the environment and culture. Um, this impact is created by means of banking. Again, savings account, loans, investments, other banking products and services. So in, in shortly, the, the products and services itself, loans or savings or bonds are not very special from a financial point of view, but they are special, of course, what, uh, in, in regard to uh, what they are used for. And so social banking differentiates itself from conventional banking by striving for a social impact of its activities. And so um, social banking tries to achieve positive social, environmental and sustainability impact through financial products and services. Um, business and operations are based on the achievement of these impacts. So if you go to the website uh, of, of a social bank, the sustainability case is the main driver just even for running this bank. So most of these banks have been started because they want to have make a change with regard to sustainable development, even before someone talked about sustainable development. So I think the first social banks have been founded in the early 1970s. And so to, to have uh, to create a, a new type of banking that has a positive impact on on sustainability. And so they focus on the sustainability case of banking. So in contrast to the um, uh, in contrast to the business case of sustainability, um, the sustainability, sustainability again is in, in, in at the core, and all activities should have a positive impact on sustainable development. Of course, most of them have a legal structure of a bank or a credit union. So it's that's an in, uh, a big difference to impact investment, for instance, where more or less everybody can do uh, impactful investments, but um, they are within the legal structure of a bank. And you can imagine that, especially at the beginning, it was not that easy to get a banking license. If you say, you know, we do all our uh, business activities in a way that addresses um, a sustainable development. Um, so examples, again, I mentioned vancity.com uh, in Canada. Um, there are um, other banks. I think Compartanos is based in Mexico. Um, of course, there's the Desjardins system uh, in, uh, in Quebec. There are many banks in the, in the US as well uh, that, uh, that are, uh, that, that, that are, that yeah, call themselves uh, a, a social bank. Um, and um, another example of a, of a local Canadian one is Kindred uh, Credit Union, and they are, uh, they are based here uh, where I, I live in, in Kitchener, uh, Waterloo. So you can have a look at, at both what, uh, what, their, uh, what their business is and how they, how they present themselves. Both of them are members of a global alliance for banking on values. And so this is a network of banking uh, banks from around the world 
that are, again, committed to advance positive change in the banking sectors. And so their goal is to change the banking system. And that's important, you know, they want to change the banking system, not just go, not just do the same as others do, so that it is more transparent, supports economic, social, and environmental sustainability, and is composed of a diverse range of banking institutions serving the real economy. So that's another important aspect in this field. And again, if you are interested, have a look on the website. So that's uh, gabv.org and you see it's, I think it's all continents and uh, they have nice stories about, um, about what these, these banks do. And so here you see the map of the banks. Um, on the one hand, they have nice, uh, nice stories about the impacts that the banks have. But what is, I think, from my perspective, even more interesting is the financial figures that show that these banks are also really financially uh, successful. So it's not that they, uh, that they have a lower performance uh, than other banks. So with that, I want to change to impact investing. And the uh, definition of impact investing is um, investments that generate social and environmental value as well as financial returns. So it's pretty similar to, to what the, the, the social banks say. And uh, another definition is the use of for-profit investments to address social and environmental problems. So again, you see a mix, um, as Majid often said, blended finance between for-profit uh, investments, non-profit investments, and addressing uh, social and uh, environmental uh, pro uh, problems. So. Um, if we have a look on the on impact investing, so there is a global impact investing network founded in 2009, and I will show you the website there as well. So it's similar to the to the Global Alliance for Banking and Values. So this is a network of 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 impact investors uh, uh, globally that is growing. Um, it's a it's a non profit uh, organization. Uh, dedicated to increasing the effectiveness of impact investing. And everybody who is involved in that, it's a great uh, resource for indicators and ways to assess the effect of impact investments. And again, they want to solve social or environmental challenges while generating a financial uh, profit, have more than 502 billion invested globally, and it's increasing. Um, and well, so just a one minute notification there. Just okay. to let you know. Yeah, that's fine. I have two more slides and that's it. So, um, uh, and as I mentioned, you can find a set of impact investments performance indicators uh, there on the website as, as well. That is very helpful if you are if you're a startup or if you are financing startup, you can use these indicators depending on the sector you are in, investing in to figure out uh, your impact. So let me finish with just to have a short look at Canada. Um, so in, uh, in Canada, we have impact assets under management uh, now with 14.7 billion, up from 8.7, uh, 8.15 billion reported two years prior. So we have a 81% uh, growth over a two year period, what is massive, of course. Um, it's still, it's, of course, it's a relatively small amount of money, but it's, it's increasing uh, a lot. So we have a significant increase in public markets uh, into public equities that now represent 41% of impact uh, assessment uh, that is reported currently. Um, so, um, and finally, as I mentioned before as well, you know, while these impact uh, investors, of course, target various rates of return, also depending on the type of investment they have, um, usually they're reporting that the performance has met or exceeded the expectations. So it's a, it's a relatively safe investment uh, compared to, uh, to many other uh, investments. And it's, 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 it's really not the type of investment that creates, uh, uh, that underperforms compared to other types of investment. So uh, I just want to finish with my, my conclusion. So uh, impact investing and social finance both address social and environmental issues through lending and investing. We see a significant growth in Canada, but globally as well. Um, and probably we see even more growth with this crisis because there's more need uh, for, for impact uh, investing during this uh, pan pandemic. What is also good news is we see an uptake by conventional financial institutions that start to do impact investing as well. I think even Scotiabank even has a department on inter 
impact investing. Impact investing, so this is one of the biggest the Canadian banks. And uh, to finish with that, uh, it's also uh, financially successful. So um, with that, I um, can stop sharing my screen and uh, move back to Majid. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that great overview to set the stage and uh, those wonderful case studies as well that people can actually go to the websites of various institutions and see how they're delivering these uh, products and services. Um, with that, I will um, um, introduce Samira Khan uh, from salesforce.org. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Samira, and your busy schedule. And I'm going to request, there you go, with your slides are coming up. Uh, Samira works at the intersection of social innovation and impact and technology at salesforce.org, uh, the social impact center of Salesforce. Uh, Samira has worked across corporations, governments, the social sector for over 13 years on innovative solutions to solving some of society's greatest challenges. She is especially interested in corporate venturing and business model innovations for good. Her work spans the Americas, the Middle East and Asia. She's a former strategy management consultant and she's played a lead role in starting and building a social impact organization. She is also passionate about topics related to gender and youth empowerment towards the sustainable development goals. Apologies to the interpreters. I have to <laughs> breeze through the um, profiles or the introduction sometimes so I can give more time to the speakers. I'm going to try to keep in mind next time to go a little bit slower on the introductions. Thank you for your patience. Yes, Samira. Majid, sorry, <laughs> but you need to slow down a bit. I, I will do that. I realized I realized after um, going through it. I'll keep that in mind. Samira, yes, over please. to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Majid. Thanks for the generous introduction. So as Majid mentioned, I'm at salesforce.org, which is one of the social impact units at Salesforce. So today I'd love to talk about investing in green technology as an equalizer. You might be wondering what that means. It's a bit of a mouthful. So hopefully we can unpackage that over this conversation or presentation. Um, there's three things I'd love to do today. One is just to give you a high level brief overview of the social impact infrastructure at Salesforce at large. Two, would love to sort of discuss with you and share with you some of the commitments we've made around um, the environment as well as sustainability and social impact. And three, present a point of view around green tech and equality, along with some concluding remarks that sort of speak to the way forward, in my opinion. So if you look back at Salesforce's history, um, it's, it's a rather unique corporation in that in 1999, when our CEO, Mark Benioff, started Salesforce, he put aside or set aside 1% for social good. And that led to this one, one, one model. We give away 1% of our people's time, 1% of our equity, and 1% of our product to social impact or to social good. So that is kind of the history or the legacy of Salesforce. Nowadays, you'll often hear Mark Benioff talk about business as a platform for change. And I really view impact investing, which was shared by Majid, as well as this notion of socially responsible investing and green tech as a part of that broader picture. So if you look at salesforce.org in particular, where I work, our main focus is a portfolio called technology for social change. So we are using the underlying customer slash constituent relationship management platform or CRM developed by salesforce.com for good. We've developed three main cloud products, nonprofit cloud that serves nonprofits, education cloud geared toward educational institutions and third philanthropy cloud. And for philanthropy cloud, our customer is a bit different. It's a private business or a corporation. And we're helping corporations think about their volunteerism, their givings, or their broader sort of CSR footprint, so to say. That's the salesforce.org tech for social change portfolio. We support it with pro bono when possible. But on our the dot-com side, it's all one company. We also have an impact fund, which sits under Salesforce Ventures. We also have a global philanthropy and engagement team that does philanthropic investments. We have an office of ethical and humane use that's thinking about the ethical use of technology and how we partner to advance that agenda. And we also have some broader partnerships. And 
I'm sharing all of this in the spirit of it takes the entire infrastructure of a corporation to really drive an agenda, like investing in green tech forward. And I'll explain a bit more about I'm that. Sorry, as well. I'm sorry, Samira, this is Eliana. We cannot hear the Spanish interpretation for some reason. If you can just give me one second, please. Okay, and I can go slower too. No, it's not that. Uh, we totally lost the Spanish interpretation. Uh, Patricia, Rosa Maria, can you hear me? Okay, uh, go ahead, Samir. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Thank you. No problem. So I was talking about, you know, the entire infrastructure across salesforce.org and salesforce.com that we have to support social impact. Technology residing in .org and some of the community partnerships cutting across both .org and .com on the philanthropic side, on the impact investment side, and generally as we're collaborating with other corporations and nonprofits to drive the social impact agenda forward, including commitments to sustainability and climate change. So as I mentioned, you'll hear our CEO talk, CEO talk about business as the greatest platform for change. And when we talk about platform, we are talking about bringing together our entire ecosystem of assets, our people, our financial capital, our product and our innovation, all to bear on social challenges. And to that end, we've made particular commitments um, in various spaces. If I want to highlight the environmental commitments, I can look at the 100% renewable energy by FY 2022, net zero emissions. Um, and we've also become a part of and helped spearhead something called the Step Up Coalition Declaration, where we've banded with other corporations in our environmental or sustainability commitments. So now I'd love to very briefly share with you a point of view. So as I was saying, it takes the entire corporate infrastructure to truly invest in a space like green tech because of the positive and the negative impacts we're having as a corporation. As you can imagine, as we put out technology into the world, we are enabling our nonprofit partners, we are enabling for-profit businesses to do good. But obviously, as you think about data centers, data centers are one of the sort of greatest contributors to our broader carbon footprint. So there are positive impacts and there are negative impacts of any given business. And as you think about technology in particular, oftentimes these negative impacts in terms of what it takes to run a center and the operations aren't appreciated. I will say that we like to call ourselves net net zero. So what that means is we are not only sort of reducing our footprint, but we are also trying to figure out ways to positively contribute. So I mentioned .org as the tech for social change portfolio. In addition, we have impact investments and an impact fund. One focus area is in fact climate change. Um, additionally, if you think about it, we are also sort of driving collaboration and coalition through movement building because we have something called 1T.org, which is about planting a million trees in partnerships with other organizations. So there's this component of a commitment and not just a commitment, but a shared commitment. And then further, there's this notion of how do we mobilize our supply chains and drive that commitment down further into our values chain? What are we expecting or what are we requiring of those who, with whom we do business? And then there's a component of what is sort of the messaging around what we do? How are we elevating this agenda around green tech? So we're really tackling the issue from multiple angles, both positive and both negative. One thing I didn't mention when I started this conversation is that I sit on the impact measurement and management team at salesforce.org. So as you can imagine, with all this work being done on both the positive and negative side, as well as investments being made, the next question is how much, how deep, how do we compare it? How do we hold stakeholders accountable? And I think, and I'll get into this a little later, I think impact measurement and management is central to that. So now for back to the title of the presentation. So green tech and inequality. It's an area that interests me a lot because there's definitely an intersection between environmental change that we're seeing, um, sustainability initiatives and driving sort of positive change, and then the negative impacts of climate change and inequality. So just in simplistic terms to give us something to think about. 
If you look at developing countries, they're not as resilient. You could have a look at Bangladesh and some of the recent things that have happened there um, with the water rising. They, they aren't able to react and respond as quickly or as effectively to the impacts of climate change. In addition, they are, they're, their communities are already sort of saturated or rife with other sorts of social issues around inequality, um, inability to access resources, the digital divide, malnutrition in particular, and heat stress, which is going to increase the incidences of death and sort of illness in those communities as a result of climate change. So that's one sort of dimension if you look at um, sort of some communities in some countries. Secondly, if you just take the United States, poor communities face greater affordability and access barriers when it comes to tech and when it comes to housing and their communities also, if you look at the investments in their communities, they are often, for lack of better words, sort of more open to this notion or they're closer to the contributors of air pollution. They are closer to sometimes factories. They're also, so on one hand, they're not able to respond. Secondly, the actual environment and the soil, for lack of better words, that they sit in, the issues and the challenges with it are deeper. So it's almost in both the case of developing countries Countries, as well as sort of communities that are poorer, it's a double, you know, double effect. It's the effect of basically already being in a challenged and compromised situation and being more susceptible. And secondarily, not being able to respond strategically and with the assets and resources required. Then the third dimension I'd like to mention is more along the lines of technology and artificial intelligence. So as we're seeing these wonderful startups come up with very interesting innovations around driving the sustainability agenda forward, as well as measuring and managing impact differently, we do know that these data sets that may potentially be used have some gaps. They haven't necessarily taken into consideration developing countries, particular subsegments of the population or segments of the population, just by virtue of what's been available. So there's this sort of notion of not only how do we drive those solutions forward to help them achieve what they actually are intended to achieve, but how do we also help certain you know, CEOs and entrepreneurs partner with those working on technologies that allow us to access a greater pool of data. Um, one interesting sort of startup that comes to mind is 60 decibels. They are using mobile phones to collect beneficiary data on the ground through surveys. So that's just an example. Majid, I see you, am I running out of time? One minute notification, Samira. Great. So in terms of the solution, a couple facets of it come to mind. Open data platforms, um, sort of open source platforms so that you can share more on data regarding vulnerable and hard to reach populations. Um, the carrot and the stick component have a role to play when you think about impact measurement and management. So there are the standards, there are the metrics, there are the outcomes, but you also need some sort of mandate and actual accountability and commitment, at least to kick it off or initially. And then there's this notion of co-funded research projects to actually drive the agenda forward so that you have the data so that you're tracking and partnerships between governments, corporations, these startups, um, access to blended and private, and private and public capital, not just for market validated solutions, but as a corporation, I'd love us to also think about those solutions that are not market validated, so don't meet the impact fund and are not philanthropic and pilot projects and policies. So I'd love to sort of quickly, um, end on the note of mentioning that, you know, it's not just sort of in North America. If you look across Asia as well, some of the hardest to reach populations are being served by very enterprising and innovative entrepreneurs. And then in addition to that, in terms of closing remarks, I mentioned impact measurement and management, taking into consideration um, various vulnerable populations being more inclusive. I think COVID-19 changes the dialogue. It's an inflection point. It presents an opportunity. I would like us to take that opportunity. Um, and then going to some of the systems change that need to take place around AI, taxonomies and disclosure. And finally, I'll end on the note that I think there needs to be a flip of script. So oftentimes there are solutions finding capitals, but there are not people who are sitting together collectively across sectors defining the problem. Um, and the last bit, <laughs> uh, sorry, I thought I was done. Um, you know, recently Jeff, uh, a particular professor behind corporate sustainable 
accounting passed away and I and I just wanted to honor his life as I sort of close out um, because I think there's a lot of academics who have spent years contributing to this space and now it's our turn to turn those sort of years of work into reality through innovations. Thank you so much. So Maria, thank you so much and uh, you know very thoughtful words about um, green tech and inequality and the connection that you made over there. I uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, and uh, a great contribution to the to the panel. Um, with that, uh, Daniel has requested a short introduction. So while uh, Daniel gets his slides up on the screen, I will um, basically just introduce uh, Daniel through one line. Uh, Daniel Fuentes is a social finance specialist with MIDA, an international development organization, and a member of the board of directors of Carolinian Canada, um, a conservation organization. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, Majid. Thank you to the organizing committee for this opportunity, and thank you all for the gift of your attention. My name is Daniel Fuentes, and I'm going to focus my presentation on a conservation finance initiative of Caroline in Canada, an organization, a conservation organization I've worked with for a number of years. Hopefully you're going to find this information useful in your green entrepreneurial journey. So Caroline in Canada is a conservation network established in 1984 with a regional affiliation of 6,000 groups and individuals who save, steward, and seed healthy ecosystems in southwestern Ontario, Canada one of the most diverse biodiverse regions in the nation. This region has also experienced the transformation of natural landscapes due to the expansion, extension of both the agricultural and urban frontiers. This is why a couple of years ago in Caroline in Canada, we started exploring partnerships in conservation finance as a way to not only mobilize the resources we needed to address environmental challenges, including losing biodiversity at an accelerated speed, but also as a way to convene new and non-traditional partners in conservation. And perhaps also as, as, our, as the previous panelists discussed, perhaps also as a, as a way to understand the problem, the challenges better so that we together with new partners could come up with innovative, efficient and scalable ways to restore and preserve natural landscapes. What you see here on your right hand side on the screen is a recent publication by the Nature Conservancy of Canada, a very prestigious and leading environmental organization in, in the country and Rally Assets, an impact investing advisory firm they feature our conservation finance model, which I, I explain in a, in a moment, in, this, in their publication as a quote, excellent example of Canadian leadership, end quote, which of course makes us very, very, very proud. So my first step, my, fir my first stop is describing conservation finance and, and what is it for? How, what, what is it, what do we, what we do with it? One of the definitions of conservation finance that I really like is one that talks about finding innovative ways to use financial resources and investment partnerships to quote, conserve the values of ecosystems or environmental systems for the long term, end quote. Of course, I don't need to convince you of the following, but I'm gonna mention it nevertheless, um, environmental systems support societies and these societies create systems to manage these supporting environmental resources and we in the business and in the investment sectors use these resources to draw upon to create long-term wealth in other words without environmental systems societies cannot survive and economic financial and other socially constructive systems cannot exist. It is very important to remember that. And it is also important to remember that people, organizations and efforts 
that aim at restoring and conserving environmental systems face a lack of access and availability of funds, resources, and according to some from the environmental sector, they are, quote, stuck in charitable and or philanthropic models and limiting governance structures, impeding their scalability and impact, end quote. That's one of the challenges that we're facing in the conservation sectors. In other words, dear entrepreneurial minds online, there is a need to come up with innovative, scalable, replicable ways to address this gap, the gap of resources. And this is where financial innovation can actually play a role. The, one of the uh, definitions of, of financial innovation has to do with, uh, uh, with the following uh, uh, components actually taking place. First, financial innovation occurs when we find new ways to use financial products. For example, self, and I'm gonna throw some jargon here for you, self-liquidating loans to cover seasonal exp expenses, for example. Second, social, uh, financial innovation takes place when we find new ways to empower traditionally disadvantaged communities. For example, by offering smallholder farmers opportunities to invest in, in investment mechanisms. Three, financial innovation takes place when we find new ways to attract traditional investment actors into impactful partnerships. For example, the very classic approach of de-risking investments by offering bank guarantees to cover losses on default loans. And I think it's important as well to remember that financial innovation goes beyond access to finance. And this is because finance carries disproportionate power in the relationships in which it is involved. According to Criterion Institute, a very well-recognized thought leader um, organization in, in the US, the power dynamics of finance can be seen when at least one of the following things take, take place. For example, the first one is, we all know that addressing financial risks are usually privileged over addressing entrepreneurs and community risks. The power dynamics of finance also take place when profit first approaches dominate over impact first approaches. And of course, the power of, of, of the power dynamics of finance are also perceived when decision making processes um, are very much finance centric and very rarely involve communities affected by these decisions. So with all this information in mind, my colleagues and I at Carolyn in Canada decided to launch a financial partnership mechanism um, as a way to find uh, new innovative avenues to supercharge conservation efforts and, uh, and also to engage new actors in, in inviting them basically and engaging them um, in, in, a, in a new uh, or innovative uh, collaboration mix. With that in mind, with, with, with this, uh, we together, we launched what is now known as one of Canada's very first conservation impact bonds. Remember the challenge that we were addressing is, was and still is that the environmental sector and the conservation sector in particular faces an ever shrinking uh, funding landscape, meaning there's always less money and resources to address increasing and accelerating environmental challenges. So the question we, the, the, the number of questions we thought about when launching, when designing and launching this, this, this finance partnership was, how can we invite and create new partnerships to decrease the loss of biodiversity? How can innovative finance 
become the bridge between the environmental sector and the sectors uh, with access to resources to accelerate and scale green efforts. So after dozens of conversations with bankers, consultants, investors, impact investors, environmentalists, conservationists, researchers, representatives from indigenous communities and public sector representatives, after gathering different perspectives and, and basically understanding the integrating this perspective these perspectives in, in the understanding of, of the challenge together, we created one of Canada's first conservation impact funds. We launched earlier this year, a partnership anchored in a financial instrument, a bond, where Caroline in Canada, an environmental organization, raised investment funds from impact investors, Birch Capital, to cover upfront costs, for the restoration and conservation of natural landscapes in Ontario. The restoration and conservation will be carried out in collaboration with Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, land trusts, and rural landowners. Once the work is completed and paved with, uh, uh, with the raised upfront capital, Caroline in Canada is going to pay back the investor's principal and interest through funding from the provincial government and a corporate sector partner, which in our case is 3M Canada. We're already working in raising additional private sector funds from high worth individuals to restore and conserve additional land across Ontario to decrease environmental uh, degradation, of course. And we, as I mentioned earlier this year, we launched the, the pilot phase of, of this uh, investment uh, partnership. And we've raised almost half a million dollars to restore 150 acres in uh, the traditional territories of the Chippewas and, and of the Thames First Nation. And we're working on scaling this partnership and take this model to the next level, which is gonna be aiming at raising $3 million to restore and conserve a thousand acres across Ontario. I'm sure you're gonna have zero questions about this presentation, but I'll be happy to, to stick around if, in case you do have one or two questions for me. Thanks again for, for this opportunity. Daniel, thank you so much. It's always fascinating the work that you're doing and uh, much easier said than done creating a conservation impact bond the amount of drive that goes into doing a project like this is absolutely fascinating and i think you're going to get more more questions than you're anticipating <laughs> with that uh, with these wonderfully diverse presentations we are moving towards our final presentation of the day um, and i will begin introducing cold powers as he powers up his uh powerpoint i should say um, Cole is co-founder of Inteleculture, which is bringing the future of fleet connectivity to agriculture. He is experienced in the automotive, renewable energies, and agriculture industries. He is a driven individual who has fallen in love with the world of entrepreneurship. Cole couples his technical experience from university alongside customer and business development to follow his passions and spark change. Cole was fortunate enough to have reached his dreams of working as an engineer at Tesla before co-founding Inteleculture. With that, Cole, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Majid. Good morning, uh, depending on your time zone, everyone. Uh, happy to chat uh, here today. Really, my, my focus and, and goal is to talk a little bit about pitching green investors, um, uh, specifically talking about my experience at Inteleculture. So just as a brief agenda and to set the stage here, I'll give you a very, very brief intro as to who I am uh, and, and a quick introduction to IntelliCulture uh, in hopes that that will sort of set the stage and, and give a bit of a baseline as to uh, the perspective from which I'm coming. Uh, from there, uh, I plan to dive right in into pitching green investors, talking about some of the success factors, financing milestones, cool. uh, early stage capital. If I can interrupt yep. you for one second. Would it be possible to turn your video off because you're breaking off, your voice is really breaking off and the interpreters are having trouble getting what you're saying. Thanks. Absolutely. Sorry about that. Is that better? 
Yes, and just uh, be mindful to, to just slow down when you're presenting. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, and so from there, I want to launch into pitching green investors, talking about some success factors, how to do financing milestones, as well as just wrap up with some early stage capital and closing advice. So uh, as, as Majid mentioned, I'm co-founder of my company, Intelliculture. Uh, I also have a background in engineering, as well as doing some speaking and writing on the side. Uh, staying true to my agriculture roots, I also ride bulls uh, as a hobby. So some might say that I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Uh, that also, I think, lends to why I'm incredibly interested in entrepreneurship. In that it's uh, it's a little bit similar, uh, despite what you may not what you might think about bull riding. At Intelliculture, really, our our goal is to help farmers cut the cost of production through equipment management software. We strive to do that by preventing breakdowns and, and cost of mistakes in, in farm operation. So we provide a software to help give farms visibility into their farms. The reason we do this is ultimately to improve farmer margins to sustainably feed the world. Uh, it's uh, going back to Samira's point she made about tech sometimes creating a divide between uh, developing countries or, or um, uh, various groups uh, in the world. That's one of the areas that we're incredibly passionate about at Intelliculture as well in that as technology is coming to the farm, there seems to be a disparity between family farming operations to the big corporates that can, that can benefit from technology. And we seek to bridge that gap. So diving into actually pitching green investors, I wanna talk about three um, high level success factors that, that I've seen uh, be very, very useful in, in my experience. Primarily investing and, and pitching is, is all about storytelling. What's really, really important is you as the entrepreneur is to have a vision of a new future. If you can't see the world in a new light, you can't expect an investor to believe you either. And with that, you wanna make the problem that you're seeking to solve relatable. Leading with why and, and conveying this new future that you wish to bring to the world is incredibly important. With that though, it's also incredibly important to remain rooted in realism. So especially when you're pitching investors in a VC landscape, Knowing your numbers and being genuine is very, very useful. Having a plan for using the funds of, that you're seeking to acquire from these investors and just be genuine. Early stage investment especially, you're not gonna know all of the answers. So being upfront about that and, and transparent with your investors that you're pitching to will go a long way. Lastly, creating momentum can be very, very beneficial for pitching investors. It creates excitement. So whether that's press, milestones or, or pushing your business forward, uh, that momentum can create a sense of urgency, which I'll touch on later, that really drives investors to write a check. Diving in a little bit more into the financing side of things, you'll see here a, a screenshot of a startup financing cycle. This is by no means original content. Um, I'm, I'm simply regurgitating and using it as a speaking aid to my experience, but I think that it's really, really important to understand this cycle. When you're planning out your fundraising uh, for, for your startup, breaking your financing into these milestones is, is really useful. So you can see in the graph, you have first, second, third, uh, as well as mezzanine. What this is talking about in the entrepreneurship realm, you might hear uh, as early stage investment, pre-seed, then a seed round, then series A, B, et cetera. By breaking your financing into stages, you can set uh, inflection points or, or sort of checkpoints, if you will, as you're launching your business. So when you do that, you wanna map these stages to various experiments. Um, that, that have a particular purpose to when you're raising capital. So for example, maybe you want to validate the repeatability of your business model in an early stage. And that might be a nice experiment for you to use pre-seed capital to, uh, to then close in on that experiment. The experiments themselves should be mapped to milestones, which you can derive from investors. So going back to that pre-seed example of proving a repeatable business model, you can go to seed investors, which would be the next stage of your financing and understand what they need to see from a business perspective to be confident investing in you. The seed investor might say that they want to see 500 k in 500,000 in annual recurring revenue. So then that can become your milestone for which you uh, are, are seeking to accomplish with your pre-seed cycle. This puts a very logical order to the use of funds and it makes it uh, a very um, compelling and elaborate plan in which you're, you're going to use that investment fund. 
So you can go to your pre-seed investors, say you need $200,000 to validate your repeated bit, repeatable business model to bring you to the milestone of 500,000 annual recurring revenue that the seed investors will then invest. And this is setting your, your checkpoints of your, of your value uh, driving your business. So I, I think one point that I also really wanna to touch on is, is around early stage capital. There's this um, excitement or hype that, that folks often wanna go out to VCs and, and bring on investment to their company. But I would challenge that notion. I would say first and foremost, the customers are king. So if you can sell an idea and get paid early, this is really, really beneficial for you as a business owner. Value the feedback that you get from these early customers and use that feedback to really um, reform your business model. Also, student ecosystems are lucrative. There are various pitch competitions, grants, and stipends designed to inspire entrepreneurship, especially of the green sense in these student ecosystems. Take advantage of those, of those programs and retain as much of your company as possible. If you think about your company as a piece of, or as a pie, ultimately you wanna retain the ownership of that pie or your business as long as possible. There's also a lot of government grants and accelerator programs that are out there that can really drive value in your business and help you launch to get off the ground without needing to go right to venture capital. So with that, I, I, would, I would challenge the notion of folks wanting to always go right to investors. Uh, avoid them early on and, and retain as much as possible. That said, it's a balance. There is a time and place to bring on investment to your company because it is better to have a small piece of a big pie than a small pie all to yourself. So with that, I'll just uh, leave three pieces of closing advice here. Um, first and foremost, I would encourage you as entrepreneurs, especially in the early stages to work on yourself. Early investment is really in the founder, not just the idea or the business. Uh, I would say that there's a baseline expectation that uh, more often than not, your initial ideas or businesses or solutions are destined for failure. However, the investors are going to be looking to founders who are really passionate about a problem space, and they'll be banking on that founder to pivot their ideas and solve that problem to bring about that new world vision that they sought to establish early on. Alongside that, harnessing resilience in yourself and your business is really, really important. Pitching and entrepreneurship is a numbers game. So pitch early, pitch lots, and get used to rejections because it's from those rejections that you harden yourself and you learn the hard lessons of entrepreneurship and how to launch a successful green business. And finally, create urgency. If, you're willing, if you do decide to go that investment route, parallelize your discussions with investors, get folks interested in your business and your solution and craft a compelling timing for the opportunity. Make sure to convey to them why now is, right import, is important for your business. Why now is the time where this solution can change the world. That's all I've got for you today. So looking forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thanks so much. Oh, well, thank you so much. That was quite brilliant. I actually learned a lot for my own startup. So we need to have another conversation after this. <laughs> Good. Yeah, glad. It is awesome. A great, um, we wanted to do a funnel approach in this event to start broad and then come down to specific. So Cole really brought that um, specific factor down for those entrepreneurs listening in right now. Um, and great stages of growth, Cole, just a lot to learn there. With that, we are going to get to questions. We have a list of questions uh, that have been submitted to us that we've been sorting through. And uh, we actually have uh, uh, individual questions for each panel member, and we have some general questions as well. So I'm going to start with Olaf, and I'm going to request Olaf, if you could please come back on a uh, video. I'm going to start with a question that was posed during uh, your presentation by um, Nick Palaszczuk. And the question is, is there a specific degree of impact required to differentiate impact investments from mainstream investments with positive yet unintended environmental or social impacts? I'll repeat it again. Is there a specific degree of impact required to differentiate an impact investment from a mainstream investment? Olaf, over to you. Thank you, and uh, hi, Nick, great question. And so I think it's less about the degree or the ratio of impact. It's rather about the intention. So of course you can have a lot of positive and negative impact without any, any intention. So 
there might be a general project that the bank is financing, let's say a hydro project, and you have a you know a pretty a pretty high environmental positive impact compared to a coal power plant or something, something like that. Um, I think there's not a not a clear and uh, not a clear cut and not a clear benchmark for what is impact investing, but it, it, it's rather the intention to do it. And of course, there you have the problem that you can m might make a small impact investment um, that has kind of a hundred percent ratio of impact. But on the other hand, someone else could invest you know, billions of money in a project with a much smaller impact and still has a net, you know, is net positive impact or a more a bigger impact than you have with your investment. So it's not a clear benchmark. It's rather, it's, it's as I said, it's the intention. And in addition, it's meeting certain um, indicators as well. So, so really meeting in impact indicators that are, that are useful. They might be related to the SDGs. They might be related to the global impact investing in, in other and other standards. So, but it's a good question, and it, there's definitely a need for for more research uh, in, in in this field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olaf. Uh, we're going to keep moving along the list of questions, and I'll pose as an individual question to each panelist, and then there's some general questions if we have time. Um, so, Samira, there's a question for you. It's a very interesting one. Um, are salesforce.org and salesforce.com separate entities, legally speaking? If so, what is the structure of the .org entity and how do you operate globally? Thanks for the question. Um, so salesforce.org is a part of .com now. It is one of the business units at .com. So you know, more or less, we can think of it as any other business unit, obviously with some caveats. Um, prior to July, 2019, salesforce.org was its own separate social enterprise. So sharing the same leadership, the same cultural elements, however, obviously a different sort of balance sheet. It was different, separated financially. And then I guess taking us back in history when Mark Benioff sort of started his commitment to social impact, it was 1% that he put aside or committed to putting aside in a foundation. So the our, our business model has evolved over time. Right now we're one company. Wonderful, thanks so much, Samira. Um, Danielle, you were wondering about questions. So this is a broad question, it's, it's a really good one. What were the main challenges? This sorry, the question is from Elizabeth Verti and Samira. The last question was from Cornelio Delgado. Uh, and getting back to Daniel, <laughs> this question is from Elizabeth. What were the main challenges you faced in launching the bond? Thanks for that question. It's a it's a good one. I I would name three challenges, if I may. The first one was. Um, was a very interesting one from my perspective. And it was uh, the, the first step that we had to take was translating the language of finance to engage impact partners, including environmental and uh, indigenous uh, stakeholders in this collaboration. We had to translate finance into terms that we could all relate to. As we all know, there is a lot of jargon and obscure concepts in finance, probably to keep non-finance people away from understanding what's happening in the finance black box. But uh, I would name that as, as the first challenge. The next one would be um, probably convincing, persuading the invest, investment and, and funding community, organization stakeholders, that, that this partnership is, uh, investment worthy. The the investment sector and the, the funding sector overall, generally, very generally speaking, is traditionally risk averse, very risk averse. And our type of collaboration and partnership, there is no precedent for, for at least in Canada, for these types of, of collaboration around a financial instrument where indigenous communities, conservation organizations, bankers, uh, academic institutions and other key stakeholders are, are engaged. It's, so 
there's there's very few precedents for these types of collaboration. So that was that was kind of challenging. And lastly, this is potentially a, a future challenge. When we take our partnership to the three million dollar level, the challenge we're going to face is that very few conservation and organ and um, environmental organizations have the capabilities to the capacity to actually manage a three million dollar uh, type of partnership. So, so we need to find innovative ways to either build that capacity for conservation organizations and or engage private sector partners to help us manage, manage uh, these uh, $3 million uh, partnership for the specific uh, um, challenges we're trying to address. Thanks for the question. It's a, it's a good one. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Cole, uh, there's a question right up your alley. Uh, considering you work with a lot of um, technology, hardware, etc., the question is the identification of eco innovations by means of technological uh, patent classes often relies on official classifications, um, which might be um, provided by different research organizations, etc which can become rigid. So this makes it difficult to identify novel technological breakthroughs. Um, and if you want, I can repeat the question. Yeah, the, I, I think I got the gist, but just to make sure that the, um, the, the question piece specifically, is it uh, looking around sort of like navigating those rigid constraints um, in, in sort of launching your entrepreneurial venture? Yes, yeah, specifically with um, with regards to eco innovations. So the the classifications are set by these organizations and third parties, and they're quite rigid. So how do we get around uh, the novel technological breakthrough, and how can we overcome this challenge? Yeah, that's uh, definitely a really good question also a really tough question so i'll do my best to uh, answer well and effectively here i think that um regardless of looking at those specific sort of constraints you're gonna have rigid containers in your entrepreneurial journey uh, regardless there's always going to be stakeholders or other individuals in your business that are looking for something particular I think that the best way that I could recommend to navigate that is to understand your audience and make sure that the story you're telling is compelling to that particular audience. Uh, so for example, um, even with IntelliCulture, we've uh, pitched to investors who aren't green centric or aren't focused on, on um, social impact investing. The, the story that I tell to them is drastically different from the one that I would tell to a very impact driven VC. Uh, that said, like it's the same story, it's just a different uh, perspective of our business. So with, a, with an impact driven VC, for example, I'll, I'll talk more about our vision for IntelliCulture and how we seek to bridge the technological gaps that exist in, in society through our, our farm management software. Uh, speaking to a more traditional VC who's not as focused on impact, I'll often um, focus more on the ROI that we bring to the farmer and our business model and the unit metrics behind that bringing that back to technology and development, um, specifically around IP protection, I think that the same premise can apply um, in that you, if you can be cognizant of those carve outs and the constraints that you need to operate within, uh, you can start to sort of look at your business model and, and your technology to see how you can incorporate that in, or at least a flavor of that into your technology, such that you can sort of abide by those constraints. Um, Hopefully that helps. I know that it's not uh, necessarily like a magic answer or, or maybe what you're wanting to hear, um, but I think that being cognizant of your audience and, and working to tailor stories for them can, can work well. Thanks so much, Cole. Let's get to a few general questions for all participants. Over here, you can just feel free to unmute while I'm asking the question and just feel free to jump in, any one of the panelists. Uh, these are broader questions. The first one is from Mohammed Asanur Rahim. And is there a framework that allows investors to validate the claims made by funds in terms of impact? Yeah, maybe that's something I can 
I can respond to. So, so as I mentioned, and I have posted the website on the, the link on the, in the in the chat. You know, that's the global impact investing network that has the has indicators that can be used. It's still, you know, it's 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 not an easy process, but you can use these indicators. There is a another framework, social uh, social return on investment that can be used. Again, so you can compare your investments with the social and environmental impacts you create there. Um, and so this is another kind of standardized way, uh, way of analyzing, uh, analyzing impact. So I would say these are the two main, main ways to do that. So saying, you know, that there are some standardized indicator systems um, to use them. Um, of course, uh, if you are a kind of retail investor and don't have too much time to do that, it's, it's really hard to analyze them then you often have to rely on narratives certain stories that they uh, that they tell and um, so this is another way to to assess the the impact of certain uh, investments that's great olaf would anyone else want to jump in there if i can add to to olaf's uh, contribution uh, i would i would also say that there are standards and and what we're trying to do with with our conservation impact bond is is Maybe think about new ways to graduate from checking thick boxes from, from an approach where our investment is, is basically uh, meeting criteria that comes from criteria that comes from the, the traditional sectors, from the investment sector, from the fi financial sector. And we're trying to find ways to level what uh, it is important for the financial sector and also for the communities in which we are um, trying to find collaboration opportunities. So I would, I would invite the audience to, to think also about um, how, do, how do we integrate different types of value, not only the financial value into, the, into a, a partnership mix, but also the value that that uh, communities seem to um, to find important as well, and other other types of stakeholders. That would be my invitation. And Daniel, while we have you there, there is another question um, for you: Is it possible to find financial support from first world countries to create a protection and conservation project in developing countries, or is the funding always local? That's a great. That's a great question. There, there are. I, I happen to be one of the um, few lucky individuals working with a uh, an organization that whose business revolves around that, around finding partnership uh, opportunities for economic development, and the way my organization works is precisely finding opportunities to mobilize resources from the global north. To, to the global south or from developed countries to developing economies. Um, I, other than answering this question in very general terms, the answer to, to the question is, is yes, there are ways to mobilize resources from developing develop economies to developing uh, uh, economies. Um, but I'll be happy to to connect with who, who asked that question and, and see if there's a, there's a way to, to answer more specifically. And uh, Daniel, that was uh, Andrea Vargas Osorio. So hopefully um, she can find you on LinkedIn or something and message you. Um, that's great. So moving back to general questions, I think we just have enough time for one last question to pose to the uh, panelists. It's a very interesting one also. Um, this is a second question from Mohammed Asanur Rahim. How is it that there seems to be a serious counter movement to prevent many funds sponsored by and representing employee groups to not abide by principles of divestment from fossil fuels? So summarizing the question, how is it that there's an opposition to um, the work about divesting fossil fuel divestment uh, when there are funds that are represented by employee groups um, and, and what is the drive behind this opposition? 
Would anyone like to jump in? Sure. Well, so probably the first one is that these employees are from the industry. And still, you know, we, we see that uh, those that are in a certain industry don't want to have this industry decreasing. Even if the jobs that you have in this industry might not be the, the greatest. So we have seen that in, you know, in, in coal mining as well, you know, coal miners have a proud of the job as well. Of course, they don't want to see the industry decreasing. And of course, they are afraid that we just, you know, take our money away in, into green investments and they, they lost, they lose their jobs and someone else takes the job in, in green, in green industry. So that's probably the understanding, the, the background of, of these kind of initiatives that are pretty understandable. So, so I think as well, you know, everybody who is doing any kind of impact investing or social investing should make sure that they do not, you know, harm other industries without offering and, you know, kind of jobs or other societal, positive societal impacts for, for them as well. So as someone, you know, if someone is in, in the green industry, you know, one is one thing to think about is, you know, how can we create jobs for those that are in the industries that are negatively affected? So what do we do with all people that are in the fossil fuel industry and all the suppliers? And, you know, there's a lot of uh, other people, you know, dependent dependent on these these industries. So this is an explanation that I, that I that I have for that. And we have one more general question. Feel free to jump in. Um, this is from Quinn McKinney. For someone who is starting their financial journey in investments, how can an individual participate in impact investing so that their money goes towards sustainable projects versus not knowing where the money is going to in a traditional bank? I can try again if nobody wants. So the first thing is you can you can engage and can you know you can be a client of a of a bank that that is a social bank. This might be a credit union. I don't know where the person that has asked the question is, is located, but uh, check your your regional credit union. Check the Global Alliance for Banking and Values. So this could be a first relatively easy step for someone who is just need who just needs a bank, you know, and don't, doesn't have big, big investments. These banks usually offer as well, kind of retail products as well. It's, there might be some responsible investment fund, even some impact investing is funds. Another way is to engage directly in local initiatives. So I'm, for, for instance, I have shares in a local renewable energy co-op. You can buy shares with that are worth a thousand thousand dollars, you get 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 a uh, dividend on them. So this is also something for retail for retail investors. So look, you know, locally who is who is there and what they do and and what they offer. And and I must say there are many kind of local initiatives that are pretty interesting from a financial point of view as well, as, especially given the current time where you don't get any any dividend or interest in a, in a risk free. Uh, uh, Investment. So this might be two things. So one thing is is is, is the, the, the pick a bank. The second one is try and figure out what is in, in the region. And uh, the third, you know, you can challenge your bank you are working with whether whether they have anything. One, what I say, you know, of course, one issue of impact investing is that most of it is is. Um, uh, steer to institutional investors. A lot of it is institutional. So, and I always talk to you know people in Serona as well. You know, it would be great so to have some retail, but it's it's hard. These are usually smaller institutions, and it's hard for them to come up with retail products. So, but given the big increase and the engagement of bigger banks in 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 Canada and the U.S. and Mexico probably as well, there might be future products. You know, mutual funds or similar products uh, that address impact investing as well. Thank you so much, Olaf. With that, we'll um, close the Q&A session. And uh, before handing it back to Brock to uh, close the entire overall session and to uh, talk a little bit about our next and, and final event, I believe, um, I wanted to thank uh, all the speakers 
first uh, for taking out their valuable time and busy schedules to talk about um, impact investing and fundraising in the startup, in the green startup context. And to all the attendees uh, who attended today and all their wonderful questions. Uh, with that, I will um, hand over to Brock. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Majid, and a great session. Lots of interesting ideas, uh, lots of great uh, content from each of the presenters. So thank you to all of you for, for the time and effort that you've put into this uh, and for the time you've shared with us this afternoon. And thank you to Majid for having pulled all these, uh, these various pieces together. Um, as, as Majid mentioned, I just want to talk briefly about next week's session. This will be the final session in our six-part series. And we started uh, five weeks ago by thinking about questions like, what is a green entrepreneur and, and how do I start a green business? Uh, and over the past few weeks, we've, we've gotten a little more detailed thinking about things like incubation and acceleration, thinking about things like financing for our businesses. Um, but many of you may still have sort of very practical questions about how to become a, a green entrepreneur. And so next week, we're actually going to spend most of our time with a, a series of young entrepreneurs, many of them student entrepreneurs, learning from their experiences as they worked through these various questions and ideas. Uh, and our topic will be succeeding as a student with a green startup. Now, you don't have to be a student. Uh, you don't have to even be young to, to, to be interested in these questions and topics but we're going to sort of speak to young entrepreneurs who've, who've had to figure out many of these, uh, these issues and these questions on their own as they've launched their businesses over time. Now we will have quite a wide range of speakers, but just to give you a sense of some of the people who are joining us next week, our MC will be Nick Palaschuk, who is the CEC's Youth Ambassador at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I will have a keynote presentation from Jackie Lee, who as a student was the founder of a very successful company called Recruit My Friends, which works in Silicon Valley and in New York City and in Toronto and other major centers around North America. And then we're going to hear from a series of students or, or recent graduates who are launching businesses as we speak. Uh, we'll have a number of those, but they include uh, Adam Stager, who founded Trick Robotics uh, while he was a student at the University of Rhode Island, uh, and Victoria Tan, who is a co-founder of Entredon, who, which is a, an alternate currency project that's uh, active in Quebec City. There will be others as well, and we really look forward to hearing all of the input and ideas that they'll have to share with us. So we hope that we'll see you for the final session in one week's time. As always, these sessions are being recorded uh, and will be available shortly on the University of Waterloo Faculty of Environment's YouTube channel. Uh, and they will be available in the near future in, in French and Spanish as well. We're currently posting them in English while the translations are completed. Uh, and eventually we'll have all of these available as a permanent resource for all of you uh, as you think about uh, where you're headed on your entrepreneurial journey. Finally, as always, thank you so much to the, uh, the, the interpreters and to the tech support at CEC. This week, uh, our normal tech support was on vacation and Liliana has stepped in to kind of run things. She's done a great job. So thank you very much for all the work there. And we look forward to seeing everybody in one week's time. Take care. Thank you very much.